Good. So yeah, today we'll be covering this uh, remarkable paper by Al Schuller and Talwar, uh, resolving the mixing time of the Nigerian algorithm. So it's a fairly new paper, and uh, what I think is, is is very nice about this result is that it simplifies a lot of what uh, it's been done in other papers to establish uh, convergence of, of the Langevin algorithm. In particular, by sort of focusing on the convergence of the discrete iteration to its own stationary distribution, rather than thinking about um, and po a possible convergence to the stationary distribution of the Langevin diffusion, right? So we know that that would typically not be possible because this, this, uh, these two distributions may have different stationary distributions. So in fact, uh, let's start with uh, so what the story is about. Uh, OK, we'll consider a setting where we have a, a convex potential f, okay, which is written in the form of a finite sum. Um, we, you know, so far in this uh, reading group, we have only been thinking of cases where this function is just a convex function. But we will consider, we will notice that this technique allows you to, for instance, use upsampling of the stochastic gradients here. So that's uh, that's very convenient for more computational purposes. And uh, yeah, so all we need is that these fi functions um, are from R d to R, are convex. Um, and we will require some form of smoothness. So in particular, I mean that I, uh, and we're going to require that each of these fi functions is uh, Lipschitz continuous gradient. OK. So this is one of the settings that we have looked into so far. Um, yeah. And you know we'll be looking at different sort of combinations of settings, but uh, the basic object of interest in this reading group is this lamp uh, uh Let me call it Monte Carlo method. We, in the paper, we call it the Langevin algorithm, which is just. Uh, Oh, and, and we're interested in the problem. I mean, the problem is, of course, uh, sampling uh, uh, x with uh, density which is proportional to um, e to the minus f, um, but over some set k, which is closed and complex. Okay, so for instance, this is new. This is something that uh, it seemed hard to do before. The analysis of this paper, you know, easily addresses that thing. Um, okay, so yeah, so Langevin Monte Carlo is, is you know consists on on this composition of operations. where dt is a uh, normal distribution. Um, with uh, variance uh, 2, 8. Okay. And notice here that since you're making the variance 2, 8, uh, is the kind of discretization that corresponds to the discretization of the Langevin dynamics, right? Remember that we want, if you want to let sort of t units of time pass, the variance increases proportionally to t. Um, and then this g is going to be some stochastic gradient of that loss or that yeah, target distribution. I mean, sorry, the, the, the target potential. So 
I mean, this BT um, is uh, chosen uniformly at random from, you know, okay, so this B will have a certain size B, and we're selecting all possible subsets of N of that size. Okay, so we're, we're just picking a mini batch at random and taking that as the uh, stochastic gradient we'll be following in this uh, iteration. Okay, I run out of space here, but the idea is that as uh, eta goes to zero, you will have as limited Langevin diffusion. Modulo this projection that Langevin diffusion is not that easy to incorporate, but, but let's ignore <coughs> that. So, which is uh, DXT equals uh, negative grad F XT uh, plus uh, square root of two dB. And this BT is the Brownian motion, it's not the batch. <laughs> so, uh, now, if, if you let T goes to infinity, so it turns out that this is a Markov chain that enjoys the properties uh, of convergence to a stationary distribution. Let's, let's not dive into those technicalities. I, I'm just claiming that this is the case. Um, in fact, um, yeah. okay, so this is, the, this is its own stationary distribution, which depends on the step size eta we pick. And then again, if, if eta tends to zero, I, this stationary distribution should converge to the stationary distribution of the Langevin diffusion, which is the result we will obtain as t goes to infinity. This thing is what we're aiming for, right? We want something which is like e to the minus f, right? Over the set uh, k. Okay, and this, this paper is about this uh, limit. And you will see that once you kind of remove the issue of what happens in the limit as eta goes to zero, this part of the story is actually much cleaner. Now, um, I'm not saying it's easy. Actually, it boils down to like a very clever um, technical contribution that, um, interestingly enough, also um, comes from the differential privacy literature. So that, that also has some, I, I, I'll try to, not discuss anything related to differential privacy, but just say that, I mean, the technique they use for, for understanding this limit comes from that uh, sort of works. But um, here we, what we are demonstrating is that the limits, we can change the limits, because we have t goes to infinity first, then eta goes to zero, and in the other way, we have eta going to zero, and then t goes to infinity. We will not be proving that. But it's, I guess you can extract it from this uh, diagram, right? It, it is true, but what I'm saying, like this paper only cares about this thing. Mm -hmm. And once you kind of phrase the question in these terms, I think there's many interesting things happening. So for instance, some of the dimension dependence that have appeared in previous uh, works that we have covered, sadly are not there anymore. So you can get convergence rates for this Langevin Monte Carlo, which are dimension independent. You no longer need strong convexity for getting this kind of convergence. That's also very interesting, right? Um, these are things that we have been seeing are kind of very difficult to get around when you look into the limits that you have in this in this case. Okay. And maybe if you still want to, you know, approach this probability distribution, you'll run into the same issues. But in some cases, you don't. You only need some kind of Markov chain that operates in this way, and just having this limit is enough for, for making your conclusions. Okay, so let's, let's go now into the, the results. So first of all, let's define the notion of mixing time. I mean, okay, here I get confused because I think People from probability theory will call mixing time something different. By what we mean here is just some notion of convergence to the stationary distribution. Mixing might be understood differently from for, for different communities. Okay, so let's just say so given a Markov chain, 
uh, XP uh, with um, stationary distribution by eta. Or yeah, let's just call it pi here. I mean, yeah, never mind. We'll be applying it to the to that thing. So just to be consistent, I'll keep that name. Uh, and a probability divergence uh, d. We will define the mixing time with respect to this uh, divergence d at some level epsilon as the infimum uh, over t greater than zero such that the divergence between xt and the stationary distribution uh, is less than or equal to epsilon. So I would say this is a convergence rate or like a complexity bound, but in the paper they call it mixing time. experiment of recording to two devices to see what works better. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, yeah, and one thing that is known from classical theory, okay, so this is more of a remark. Um, For the sake of proving convergence rate, it suffices to just look at a constant uh, bound on epsilon there. And that's because the, at least for total variation distance, um, if you're able to establish that, that kind of mixing time bound with some number, I don't know, k, and then if you wanna turn this mixing time of one quarter to an arbitrary epsilon, you just kind of run it until you get a one fourth then you, you start from there as a warm start, and you repeat, and there's this sub-multiplicative property of the, um, of the probabilistic divergence that is gonna tell you in the end that if you wanna boost this from one quarter to any epsilon, the only extra factor you're gonna pay is like log one over epsilon. So, um, and this, you can find this uh, kind of uh, analysis in, the, in this book by uh, Levin uh, Perez. And uh, Wimmer, I believe. This is the Markov chains book. Okay, so um, the point is like if uh, at least for total variation, you can prove an upper bound, you know, of a one one quarter, then you can turn this into a, an upper bound uh, for any epsilon, which is just the same number of times, I think it's log base two of uh, one over epsilon. So very little cost to get an arbitrary approximation. Okay, what is the theorem now? Um, so we're gonna consider K subset of RD close convex, right? Uh, with uh, diameter D greater than zero. Uh, we have this F1 through Fn uh, convex and L1 smooth, right? Uh, batch size B less than or equal to N. That's for the sampling of these functions. Um, the step size um, eta needs to be less than uh, one over the smoothness constant. Then uh, for Langevin Monte Carlo, we'll have that it's mixing time uh, with respect to the total variation distance. 
is upper and lower bounded by d squared over a. Okay, so mixing time bound depends on the diameter squared. Uh, eta, we wish we could make it as large as we want, right? To make this smaller, but there's a limit. You cannot pick this step size to be too large. And this views we have also seen in other contexts, right? Uh, at least intuitively, if you push the step size to be too large, the discretization of Langevin in uh, Monte Carlo to the continuous limit is, is pointless, right? It's, it doesn't really work. But we will see here that there's another reason why we are not able to push this uh, step size spread. The paper also contains an interesting lower bound. Okay, I will not discuss the details of the lower bound. I'll, I'll just say what is the nature of this lower bound, which I find very, uh, very useful. It's has like a very nice intuition. Um, okay, so, so some comments before we move on. I, I don't know if there's any questions at this point about the this whole thing. So first of all, the boosting result that we described here uh, implies Notice, then again, also, there's no strong convexity assumption made here. Um, okay, two, there's a matching lower bound in the paper. As I said, I won't, won't go into the details of this matching lower bound. I just kind of um, appeal to your intuition here. So it's what what's interestingly happening is like, why would you expect the diameter to appear in this mixing time bound? Okay, so suppose that your your set is just the real line. Here's your set K. It has diameter D. Every time you move in this in, in, in this fashion, right? I mean, there's this, there are these normal random variables, but if you just look into the kind of, I mean, you can think that there's like a fairly good discretization of the space you can make here with um, intervals of length eta. Because every time you move from x t to an x point, everything is sort of scaled by eta. Well, the, the Gaussians are by square root, but let's ignore that for a moment. You can roughly think that there is, there is, there is a discrete Markov chain in the space. So the question, I mean, one question you can wonder, right, is if I start from here and I let a random walk, I mean, actually, the, okay, to be more fair, um, let's not go into the boundary because of the boundary, weird things happen. What happens if I'm here? Let, let's say this is like d over 4 or something. Right, so if I'm, I'm sufficiently to the left, how long is it going to take me to get sufficiently to the right? I'm just doing, and, and the point is like when you're not too close to the boundary, you have this symmetric random walk of, um, yeah, and there's, there's one over eta steps that go from here to here, right? So, Roughly, this one over eta comes exactly because of that. Like, what's going to take me from starting from this point to get to this point, which is a so-called reachability question for Markov chains, has this scaling of one over eta. The diameter appears because, I mean, here I'm kind of normalizing things to look as a discrete Markov chain, but we're actually working on this metric space, which is the real line. So the diameter should play a role as well. Right, so. Uh, and it's, it's not a difficult argument, which, which I also find remarkable. In the paper, they explain why reachability alone implies this lower bound for, for the mixing time. Um, okay. Three, three, uh, no dimension dependence. Then again, this is something that was not possible before. When we're looking at Langevin diffusion, 
all the upper bounds were definitely in dimension, and we kind of thoroughly discuss why this happens. There's there's different technical reasons, but the, they seem to be unavoidable. Okay. Whereas in this discretized setting, you don't have this issue. I mean, if, if you want to think about it, it's like it turns out that in order for this thing to be sufficiently close to the uh, e to the minus f, right, the, the target distribution of the, the diffusion, this eta needs to be small enough, and that small enough needs to be dependent on the dimension. So when you when you really try to kind of close that uh, diagram, you can end up paying for dimension because of the discretization cost. Okay, and fourth, uh, no need for strong convexity. And I may discuss a little bit hap what happens in strongly convex case. It turns out that in fact you can you can turn some polynomial bounds into exponentially convergent terms as, as you do in optimization. But um, I guess the point of this paper is that you don't actually need to assume strong convexity. So it's already interesting to discuss uh, what happens there. So I yeah, strong convexity might show up in, in some of the things that I wrote, but I, I, I don't want to dive too much into that because I think it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's not very, it's not the most interesting part of the, of the result, in my view at least. And, you know, for those of you who know optimization very well, um, you will also find appealing the sort of arguments that are done here because the kind of proof strategy to prove this mixing time bounds is, is very rooted in the properties of convex optimization algorithms. Okay. Um, let's let's go there. So one of the points, I mean, and this is not, as I said, this is not coming particularly from this work, but it was a line of work preceding that was focused on these issues of uh, differential privacy. And there was, yeah, the, the main contributions, I think, that, that are being used here come from that uh, line of work. But first, let's note it that this Langevin uh, Monte Carlo method is uh, composed um, by two, um, I would say, nice operations. And for a second, let's ignore the projection. Okay, so first step is this uh, non expansive. or alternatively contractive in the case of strongly convex uh, gradient step. By this I mean that I, the operator T that we're first taking in this Langevin Monte Carlo method is you take X, you subtract the gradient. I, I know I put a capital G here, but let's for a moment just think that this is the, the, the whole function, right? And from convex optimization theory, we do know that this thing denotes, I mean, it, it, uh, when these functions are convex and smooth, this step is not expansive with respect to x. Meaning that if I have some point x here, some point y here, and I let this thing iterate, as long as eta is less than or equal than 1 over 1, or is it 1 over 2 over 1 over 1. Um, you know that you won't be letting the points uh, get any further away from each other. Right. That's nice because hopefully that, that is an indication that things remain stable over time. Right. So for instance, if we're aiming for mixing time, this, this kind of property is desired. Right. So um, yeah, a 
and it's going to be non-expansive if, if f is just convex and smooth. It's going to be even contractive if, um, if f is also strongly convex. So, you know, if, you, if you're in the contractive case, I mean, things would kind of approach each other very quickly. So one can expect that nice things happen there, but in this non-expansive case, it's less clear, right? You, you know that things do not get any worse, but you're not guaranteed that they're getting better. So, um, okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just write down what, what that means. Uh, so if F is uh, convex, uh, L1 Lipschitz and the step size eta is less than or equal than 1 over L1, then uh, we'll have that T is uh, non-expansive, which means that norm of Tx minus Ty uh, is less than or equal than norm of x minus y. Okay? If also uh, let's further assume that um, f is uh, lambda strongly convex and um, eta is less than or equal than 2 divided by L1 plus lambda, then we'll have that t is um, 1 minus eta L1 lambda divided by L1 plus lambda contracted. So if you, if you call this factor kappa, what you have is that Tx minus Ty is less than or equal than kappa uh, norm of x minus y. Okay. And I'm not going to prove these results. This is like classical uh, properties of, of convex functions. Yeah, and hopefully that also helps with the mixing time, right? Uh, because the outcomes of the samples would be, you, you could say that are getting more and more similar. Right? Can we have that uh, without uh, the strong context? Yeah, yeah, we'll prove the result just for the non-expansive case. But I'm just pointing this out because in the paper they, they, they include results for the contractive. So that's the first operation, and if you ignore the projection step, right, the second operation that appears in the Langevin Monte Carlo is the uh, addition with Gaussian distributions, right? Can you say something that you have like weight tendency? Nothing quantifiable. Okay. So you have, um, I mean, if you have strict convexity and smoothness, you only have non expansive. I mean, the other thing is, which is kind of annoying, is like this is true only for the two norm or any Euclidean norm, but for other norms we don't know, right? Uh, I mean, that actually we do know that it's not necessarily the case. So we're we're kind of stuck with this like uh, gradient descent style of algorithm. Okay, so the second the second step here is the Gaussian convolution. So what we're saying is like if you have some x, you're going to turn it into x plus psi, where x is a random variable, right? And this psi is a normal with certain variance. And the question is what kind of regularity is induced by this kind of noise addition, right? So um, 
I mean, notice that this, this operation, in a sense, is also non-expansive, right? So if I, if I would be applying this to a random variable x and y, and I just add Gaussian noise, any kind of probability divergence would be, by the data processing inequality, just be no larger than what it was before. So like this is a very vague statement, and, and this is only for divergences that do satisfy the data processing inequality, but nevertheless, what, what we could say is that x plus psi, y plus psi, morally speaking, right? This should be no larger than the divergence of x and y. So this is also a form of non-expansiveness. Then again, non-expansiveness does not seem to be enough to say that things are converging. It's just telling us that things do not get any worse. Uh, so the question is, how do we use these two things simultaneously to get some kind of gain in, in the arguments we're trying to make. Okay, so, and here's where it comes a really clever part of the, of, of, as I said, not just of this paper, but the whole kind of private simplification by iteration technique. Um, so here's where the meat comes. This is the uh, shifted range divergence. So for some z greater than or equal to zero, we define the z shifted range divergence, or I should call it KL divergence in this case. Uh, so it's gonna be the KL shifted. Uh, this is defined in the following way, is the infimum of the KL divergence of mu prime with respect to mu, where mu prime is such that its infinity Wasserstein distance with respect to mu is upper bounded by z. What do I mean by this? Wasserstein infinity between mu and mu prime. Uh, okay, so Wasserstein of order p, right, is the expectation to the p power of the any sort of coupling, right? So the half couplings here is going to be the infimum over mu comma u prime coupling of uh, mu mu prime, right? So mu u has Marginal distribution mu, mu prime has, uh, sorry, u prime has marginal distribution mu prime, right? That's a coupling. And then when we look, it's into the essential suprema. So I'll just write suprema here over, um, maybe. Uh, supremum over the I mean, what I'm trying to say is the supremum over the realizations on this coupling space, right? So when, when you have other vast strength metric, you will have here the expectation of, let's say, u, comma, u minus u prime with respect to a certain distance, which in this case is just the two norm. Um, but here we're just doing the worst case because it's infinity vast strength distance. Is that the same? Oh, um, I would say no a priori. Let me try to remember why. Okay, so first thing is that this is a, what you could say a geometry aware sort of distance, right? So because you quantify things. Total variation, um, you could do change of variables, you could transform the space kind of in, in arbitrary ways, and that will keep the total variation distance invariant, right? So. And that's, that's what makes this like shifted KL divergence interesting. Because you're letting now your divergence to be able to, let's say, kind of uh, sweep under the rug, you know, transport between these, like you don't need to quantify the KL divergence directly between mu and mu. You can transport mu a little bit, as much as z, and then you can use that as the, what you measure for KL divergence. So as, a, as an example, I mean, the, the most basic example would be, this is super trivial, uh, but 
if you have mu, you know, delta at zero, let's say mu is delta at z, right? So the KL divergence between these two, uh, of course, is plus infinity. But if you let the KL divergence of level z of mu and mu suddenly become zero. Because you transport the delta and then you have zero divergence. You could do the same trick if you have just two distributions which have this form, let's say, like that kind of support, and then you have another density which is like this, right? So same density but shifted by z. Those will also have zero shifted KL divergence, but it will have inf not well, yeah, they will have infinite KL divergence. Right? Exactly, exactly. It's, it's like a regularized by neighborhoods of Wasserstein metric. Yeah. And this is this is all we need for getting. I mean, this is basically the potential which is driving the convergence analysis of of this uh, Langevin Monte Carlo. of running out of time already and this is where the things get interesting but let's see so let me explain what are the key sort of results uh, that are needed for this convergence proof and if I have time left I will prove each of these two lemmas that I will present now so and, and let me say that this again it, it traces back to this very nice paper on privacy amplification by iteration of uh, Feldman, Mironov, Talwar and Takurka from 2018, and then another paper by Altruder and Talwar from uh, 22, which is a different paper from, from the one I'm presenting now. Okay, so the first is, uh, they call it contraction reduction lemma. Uh, contraction reduction lemma. even though in this case we'll apply it to non-expansive mapping, but in the paper they call non-expansive mappings as contractions. So that's, that's what we use that name. Um, for every operator T which is non-expansive, uh, we will have the following property. The shifted KL divergence between these are the push forward measures for mu and mu through t uh, is less than or equal than KL z of mu. Okay, so this is, um, yeah. One, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm saying something wrong here. Um, yes, sorry. I mean, this is true, this is a data processing inequality. There's nothing, I mean, it's a data processing inequality for the KL divergence, uh, the shifted KL divergence, which is, I guess, a non-trivial claim. But let me also say more generally, if T is uh, C contracted, so that I'm able to include both the non-expansive and the contracted case, then you can say the following. So on the left-hand side, you can get, I mean, this is a boost now. It's not just data processing inequality. Because if you're making the shift smaller, right, you're letting less slack in terms of the neighborhood in Wasserstein uh, metric. So you're, you're requiring more on this side uh, in terms of this upper bound. Right? Okay. So that's one. And I think that for what I'm going to do right next, I'm, I'm just going to need it for c equals 1 because we're treating with a, a non-expansive case. But anyway, so this is, this is sort of an analog uh, of the data processing inequality. But for the shifted uh, KL divergence.
So it's not yet clear what is the role of these shiftings, right? It doesn't look anything strange going on here. Um, but here, here's where it comes. So this shift reduction lemma says that for every shift uh, a greater than or equal to zero, we have that the shifted KL divergence with slack C, uh, Z of mu convolved with a normal distribution um, against the same thing applied to the new distribution. is upper bounded by the shifted KL divergence of level Z plus A, uh, mu given mu. And then we have um, A squared divided by two sigma squared. Um, so let me say, first of all, yeah, this is the KL divergence between two normal distributions which have means that differ by at most A. Yes? Is uh, zeta or A? Uh, Z. Oh. And here is Z plus A. Oh, okay. So um, here again, I mean, yeah, the kind of slack you have here is smaller than this one on the right-hand side. So you're gaining something there, but there is a cost. And the cost is this displacement of normal distributions that you're in, right? So then again, for one thing is if we believe that shifted KL divergence is satisfied the data processing inequality, it's certainly true that KLZ of this is less than or equal than KLZ of mu against mu. But here we want to get a slight boost, right? We're going to get something which is better than before. And there's a cost here, but you can sort of accumulate this cost. So in the end, I mean, the, the proof of convergence is going to be a mixture of this contraction reduction lemma with this shift reduction lemma and an induction. That's all. So how do we combine these two results? Inductively, I mean, what we'll have is that okay, we have the, K, the shifted KL divergence of, let's think that mu is the marginal distribution of xt, or xt, yeah, xt. So from xt to xt plus 1, right, there's two operations. There's first this non-expansive mapping, right, which is a gradient step, and then there's Gaussian noise. I think it's uh, eta here. I forgot exactly if it's eta or two eta. Uh, two eta. Two eta. Yeah. And this is uh, KL divergence of this with respect to the same thing applied to mu. Okay. I, and uh, and what I'm gonna do, as I said, this guy is gonna be xt. This guy is going to be the stationary distribution. If it is the stationary distribution, I'm always getting by eta. So I will be effectively proving an upper bound in terms of the shifted KL divergence of my TT period against the, the uh, stationary distribution. That's very similar to the convergence proof we do in optimization. We say, what's my distance to the optimal solution in xt plus 1 based on the, the distance from x? Okay, and using these two results, right, you, you first use 
the effect of Gaussian convolution, right? So you get that thing over there, and then you can use the property of non-expansive mapping, which is telling you that the KL, shift to KL divergence doesn't increase. So in the end, you're gonna get KL Z plus A. For any A you get to pick between mu and nu, plus A squared divided by 4A. This, since we're using uh, Q eta as our uh, maybe it's squared here. No, 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 it's the variance. Ah, oh, gosh, yeah. It's A squared divided by two sigma squared is just eta. Um, it's two eta. Sigma squared is eta. Okay. Okay, so we use induction. Right? How many times? Capital T times. Uh, and we set um, A to be equal to capital T, D divided by capital T. Okay. So notice that this is gonna, every time we do these steps, right, we're gonna get a contribution of this term. So in the end, it's gonna be capital T times here. And every time we're doing this, we decrease by, um, by A. So, I mean, the conclusion is K of divergence between XT and XT prime. Is that a true one of those normal distributions you send for a phase? Um, or, or the A doesn't play a role in the way it's solved? No, no. It's, it's, we're, we're applying the same sort of convolution to these two Thanks. Uh, the A appears because of, um, just a second. Um, the A appears, um, notice that you can choose, choose any A you want here. So it's not, the, the left hand side does not depend on A. You're free to choose your, your slack here. So, so there's no need for having the A on the left-hand side. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I, yeah. Okay, we get this bound, right? We use induction, and as I said, okay, what I wanna do in the end of my potential function argument is end up with the zero shifted KL divergence, because I wanna get an upper bound in terms of KL divergence. Uh, and the idea would be every time you iterate, you reduce the shift, right? So after doing this t times, you're gonna have KL of uh, t times A, right? Which is capital D between x uh, zero and x zero prime plus, um, T times A squared divided by four uh, eta. Now, <laughs> this is interesting. The amount of shift that I have here in the beginning is just as much as the diameter of the set. So it doesn't even matter what, what I start from. This is zero. Okay, so I said I was gonna apply this to the stationary distribution, but it doesn't even matter. It could be anything. The cool thing about the stationary distribution is in the end it's gonna give me an upper bound of K xt versus the, but, but you could up, this is effectively a mixing time bound in the sense that mixing time for me is like, if you start the Markov chain from two different places, how long before they get close enough, right? So this is a mixing time bound, which can also give you convergence, right? And remember that A was chosen in this way so we can, we can further develop this, this quantity. Squared is, is this squared divided by capital T okay, no, squared? It's, 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 it's shouldn't be that way. Yeah, not here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're not, re we replaced it here. I mean, I, I use that this is A times T, but I haven't replaced it here yet. Um, so what we'll get is D squared divided by four eta T. And this is very nice because it tells you that things are converging. It decreases as you make more steps. Um, okay. 
Cool. Okay, this is what we were claiming, right? I already raised the board, but that was the main claim. And uh, of course, now you let x zero prime have marginal distribution equal to to mu, and that means that every x t is going to have the same distribution as this, right? So therefore, that's going to give you a convergence. Um, okay, great. It's less than ten minutes away. <laughs> Let me finish by, okay, I proved this for KL divergence. How do we get an upper bound for uh, total variation? We use spin skirts inequality, right? So, and we do this because total variation is kind of the most standard measure of divergence between probability distributions. Uh, in a sense, it's like a worst case guarantee as well. So it's it's important, I guess. Yeah. So TB between XT and, oh, I, I call this new, sorry. This should be the stationary, right? That's what I wanted to say. Um, this is squared is less than or equal to one half KL divergence between XT and uh, phi eta, and we already said that, that this is less than or equal than so we get one uh, eight b squared divided by eta t. Okay. Uh, what did I say? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I will. Okay. We wanna make t equals two d squared divided by eta. So if we do that. When you replace here, uh, we're gonna get two, right? So you get one over 16. And then you take square roots, you're gonna get the total variation distance to be at one one fourth, which is what we, what we wanted to prove, okay? Um, yeah. Okay, uh, now I need to get started with the technical <laughs> parts of the presentation, but... Um, Let's, let's just do one of the lemmas. Maybe I continue next time. Okay. Just to take advantage of the few minutes we have left. So let's start with this one, actually. Let's prove this contraction reduction lemma. This, this other one is, I guess, the most interesting one, but uh, it's going to take a few more minutes. Okay, so that's what we have, right? That's the statement of uh, contraction reduction lemma. What we're going to do is um, all these proofs work in the following way, I mean, roughly. Um, if you want to prove an upper bound on a composition of two distributions in terms of their starting distance with the shifted divergence, first pick this mu prime that realizes the shift. So by definition of a shifted divergence, um, let mu prime be such that the Wasserstein infinity distance between mu and mu prime is less than or equal to z, right? Um, and uh, such that now the, oh, sorry. I need to generalize this construction reduction lemma for Rengi divergences now. So, okay. I'll, I'll just make a brief comment on that. Okay, so what is the Rengi divergence between two distributions mu and mu? This is one over alpha minus one logarithm of the integral between, uh, let's call it uh, that, right? So it's, and, and what we need to know is that when, when alpha tends to one, this d alpha will tend to the KL divergence. So in particular, if we prove this for Rengi divergences, we'll, we conclude it for the KL diverge, for the shifted KL divergence as well. Okay, so uh, now mu prime against mu is less than or equal to 
A. No, I, I'm just not. I'm just replaced by that. Okay. Now, um, yeah. We have this coupling between mu and mu prime, right? What if we try to use it with a push, uh, push forward measure, right? So since uh, T is C contracted, I do have a coupling now between mu T minus one with mu T minus one, right? Um, right, so I mean, what I'm trying to say is what is the Wasserstein infinity distance between mu of T minus one um, versus mu T minus one? Okay, so every point that, that was coupled between these two distributions, now you can couple it in the same way. And when you compose, you know, by, by the contractive property, it's gonna be C times the Wasserstein infinity. Uh, sorry, mu prime here. Mu prime. So, and we said that this is less than or equal to C. That's where the z times z appears over here, because now you get a, a tighter coupling. And that's all. Now, now you say, what is the alpha divergence uh, shifted by z, z of uh, mu o t minus 1 and mu o t minus 1? Um, since we get this coupling with z, z is, is going to be less than or equal than the alpha divergence between mu prime and uh, mu, which we already said is less than or equal to that. Okay, so that with that I will finish. Uh, next time I'll do the second lemma, and I think we can call it.